This episode is brought to you by Paycor, the HR and payroll software made for leaders. It's never been harder to recruit, hire, and engage workers. That's why HR leaders and frontline managers depend on Paycor for all things people management, from onboarding and performance reviews to compensation and benefits. Learn more at paycor.com slash leaders. About a decade ago, Liara Rue was working at a tech job in the Bay Area and hating it. Then something better came up. And a friend of mine was a dominatrix and she told me that I thought I might like sex work better. And I did. So Rue, who's genderqueer, decided to become an escort. They were aware of some challenges, including one many outsiders may not think about much. That's banking. Rue knew that keeping money at a traditional bank might be an issue. Traditional finance doesn't like dealing with sex work. It's a problem that's plagued the adult industry for decades, dating back to the 60s. But for a while, Rue managed to hang on to their bank account. A few years down the road, they figured out that I was a sex worker and they shut down my account. Losing bank accounts and being shut out of traditional banking altogether is common for sex workers. As many as two-thirds have lost access to either a bank account or financial service, according to data from the Free Speech Coalition, a U.S. trade association for the adult industry. Some 40% have lost access to a bank account in the past year. Unfortunately, it's really difficult. Um, I think banks have gotten really good at figuring out if someone is a sex worker. And unless you're really careful um, with how you make payments and receive payments, chances are you've had at least one form of banking shut down, whether that's Venmo, traditional bank account, or credit card. Rue, who banks under a different name, is unsure exactly how the banks found out about their new career. But they have a hunch that what tipped the banks off was a transaction made under their work name. So I'm pretty sure the bank saw a payment in my account that said Liara Rue on it, and then they were able to Google that find out that I was a sex worker. It's hard to overstate how difficult it is to function without access to a bank account, especially if you're operating any kind of business. Rue has seen this happen to lots of people. Losing one source of stability like a bank account can have this cascading effect where very quickly, you know, they're unable to pay rent, unable to open a new account, um, that sort of thing. And honestly, just having a bank account closed in the first place is really demeaning and really just adds a little bit of chaos and stress into your life. That's really unnecessary. Enter crypto. It's become popular with sex workers. Roof started accepting it from clients in 2015 and also used crypto to pay for ads online after credit card companies stopped processing payments for marketing related to sex work. Luckily, Rue never had to fully rely on crypto to get paid. But for some of their peers, the story is different. I had a couple of friends who were undocumented, and so their relationships with their banks were already tenuous. And so for them, often they accepted payment in cash, but that was really hard because, you know, you had to get it at the booking itself. And so it becomes really dangerous. You know, maybe the person doesn't have cash. Maybe they try to take it back at the end. And crypto becomes really great for people like that because sort of no take backsies. You can't do a chargeback. It is sort of this extra judicial currency. So they were really able to have a sense of security that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. But there's a new problem. The U.S. government has started to crack down on the crypto industry. And what was once a lifeline for sex workers is becoming more and more difficult to use. It has gotten a lot harder for people to accept crypto. Um, Sites like Coinbase, which used to be relatively lax in terms of the types of things you could do with one of their accounts, really started cracking down Um, a couple years ago. um, I think they really just wanted to make sure that when regulation does come, they won't get shut down. So, today on the show, why sex workers turn to crypto and how crypto turned on them. 
I'm Emily Peck, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about tech, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned, double. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant, doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard, also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. This episode is brought to you by Paycor. Paycor empowers leaders to build winning teams. With Paycor, leaders can recruit, onboard and train employees, set goals, and drive performance. If you're a leader, everyone depends on you. Who do leaders depend on? Paycor. Learn more at paycor.com slash leaders. The Justice Department is seeking a backdoor way to stop what it considers to be questionable financial ventures by going after the third-party institutions that process their payments. To understand how sex workers came to rely on crypto, we have to go back roughly a decade. In 2013, under the Obama administration, the Department of Justice launched a program meant to fight fraud that it said was prevalent in certain industries. The initiative was known as Operation Choke Point. Let's say it firmly reminded banks of their duty to to screen businesses from industries that are said to pose an elevated risk of fraud. And among those industries were payday lending, were firearms, but, but also pornography. That's Joel Khalili, a reporter at Wired. He recently wrote about the ways sex workers relied on crypto and how it started to fail them. So in, in Republican circles, that scheme was suspected to have been devised as a, as a way of putting disfavored industries under pressure, kind of through the application of soft power. So instead of going through Congress to impose a ban on, on X or Y industry, which involved kind of all manner of political mm-hmm. friction, right? Instead, you know, the banking regulators leaned upon the banks to kind of choke those industries out instead. That's that's what the theory goes. An investigation later conducted by the Justice Department kind of dismissed that interpretation. is nonetheless suspected to have caused banks to, to sever ties with the adult sector. As for Operation Choke Point 2.0, that's the crypto industry's uh, kind of calling back to the original Operation Choke Point. It's saying that that we are now facing the same problems that faced uh, that payday lenders, that firearms, that the porn, uh, pornography industry faced um, under under the original Operation Choke Point. Right. So it's it's basically like a, a way to get these industries out of the mainstream by cutting off their access to banks. Because if you don't have access to a bank in 2023, it's pretty hard to stay in business, whether you're a crypto company or a sex worker. Right. That's it. That's it. So from, you know, from, from the crypto company's perspective, you, you effectively cannot operate, right? You can't pay your staff, you can't pay uh, partners, you can't handle the conversion of dollars into cryptocurrency. You, ju- you cannot operate without uh, access to banking. And what happened as a result of the first operation choke point? Did people go out of business? Did a lot of, is that when sex workers really started to get cut off from, from the financial sector, from banks or what happened? So sex workers, and this is by the way, irrespective of whether they engage in legal or illegal sex work, have found it difficult to secure banking services for for decades, Mm -hmm. at least since the 1960s, around which time the pornography industry was kind of beginning to to grow at a, a, at a serious clip in the US. It, it's more the case that Operation Choke Point is suspected to be among a number of events that kind of contributed to making that problem more acute. It's largely um, uh, anecdotal evidence, right? The, the industry suspects that its problems were aggravated by this initiative. Right. And I guess what happened also, as you said before, is more there, there were more sex workers coming into the industry. So more... Um, people who are going to get unbanked. So it becomes a bigger problem because more people are doing the, the actual work. Right. And, and that's that's kind of specific to the, the condition of the last few years with the rise of these, these digital creator platforms, um, mm-hmm. you know, whether that's OnlyFans or, or fans leave. In the U.S., full-service sex work, also known as prostitution, is illegal in every state except Nevada. But other forms of sex work, like selling nude images or broadcasting from a live cam, are legal. For banks, the difference doesn't seem to matter. 
And how do banks find out if when a sex worker is a sex worker? Yeah, so that's um that's that's an interesting question. But because of the lack of transparency surrounding the reasons for account closures, we're reliant to, to an extent on on speculation yeah. here. But so sex workers believe that there could be a few different ways that a bank might kind of cost an on and uh, a tip off from an individual or an anti-pornography mm-hmm. lobby that disapproves of what they're doing. Wow. Perhaps it's uh, the, the origin of the inbound payment or the payment reference, for example. You know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you might have some come into your bank account with a payment reference from OnlyFans.com or from mm-hmm. uh, whatever other business that is very clearly associated with the adult industry. The other possibility is that it's the the pattern of the payment. So because of the nature of the work and because sex workers are kind of perpetually concerned about losing access to their bank accounts, they tend to receive a high volume of transactions and then withdraw those funds immediately. The thinking in in some corners of the adult industry is that this pattern might be looked upon by the banks or, or at least you know the automated systems that the banks use uh, as a red flag and perhaps indicative of criminal activity. But the reality is that it, it's never really clear, uh, one, how the banks find out that they as a client work in the adult industry and, and two, the reasons for, for the, the policy against serving people that operate in that industry. Yeah, we just, um, I also host the Slate Money podcast. We just talked about, the, there's a broader issue where people get their bank accounts closed and they don't know why, maybe because they took like a trip somewhere or spent or received a large sum of money. And then all of a sudden they're blocked from access to their bank account. But for most of those people, they just go and open a bank account somewhere else. But for for sex workers, the way you describe it in your piece, it's sort of like a whack-a-mole. Like they go and open another account that gets closed and then on and on. Based on my conversations with um, people that operate in the industry, it is common for personal bank accounts to be closed. But what's particularly difficult is for, for a sex worker that's attempting to set up a business bank account to secure that service in the first place. So Ali Ray, for example, um, you know, went from bank to bank to bank. She says that she went to visit kind of every bank under the sun and none would give her a bank account in the first place. Um, I, I believe it's somewhat easier to find a new um, bank to provide you with a, a personal account. Mm-hmm. But then the risk is always that that bank account is later closed with you know at zero notice and, and uh, with no justification, leaving your cash uh, sometimes kind of locked inside. For sex workers, the idea of an alternative currency, like crypto, is more than just a way to circumvent a hostile banking system. It's a way to take control of the money they've rightly earned. Without it, and without access to a bank, workers can be left extremely vulnerable. So in the story, I kind of point to the fact that this is a bit of a a sliding scale, right? So not having access to to bankings and, and, and payment services is it can create small issues, small frictions in your life, right? It means that you can't split a bill with your friends uh, after dinner. Mm-hmm. It raises questions, you know, why don't you have access to cash app? Why don't you have access to Venmo? You're forced to ask uncomfortable questions, right? Perhaps the people that you're socializing with aren't aware of your line of business and that's something mm-hmm. that you're planning on disclosing. And then on the complete other end of the spectrum, it can create, you know, really dangerous situations whereby you become reliant, dependent on other people for access to financial services. So whether that's a partner or a friend or whoever else, if you need to rely on them to to custody your your wealth, you know, by definition that creates opportunity rather for for abuse. It creates dangerous situations. No matter the intention of of the person who may be very well meaning, the problem is that it creates opportunity. Right? It's a loss of control. Absolutely. You know, one source that I spoke to was pointing to the irony of all of this, which is that you know the the policy of the banks, um, at, at least at, at face value, as far as we can guess is that they are um, refused to, to bank members of the, the sex work community in order to limit the risk of sex trafficking. Without bank access to banking services, you leave sex workers in a position where they're much li- more likely to be sex trafficked because someone can, uh, you know, control over someone's finances is one of the chief mechanisms by which someone is able to exert control over, uh, over someone that's being trafficked. When we come back... At one point, crypto was a lifeline for sex workers, but not anymore. A lot of us probably struggle with sleep hygiene, how to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get restful sleep. But did you know that improving your sleep hygiene could help improve your overall health? 
Health Break, a podcast by UPMC Health Plan, dives into this topic with advice and tips you can use from our expert wellness health coaches. Listen now to find out how you can start improving your sleep at upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. That's upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. Hi, you guys. Are you thinking about the same things I am? Like, are you trying to figure out the right way to make fun of Casey DeSantis? Are you similarly concerned about the scourge of bad men from Toronto? Tory Lanez, Tristan Thompson, and Drake, of course, Drake. Are you also worried about the erosion of abortion rights, the restrictions put on gender-affirming care, and what it means if Kyle Richards is actually a lesbian? Great, me too. Now we can do this together. I'm Sachi Cole. You might know me from the podcast Scamfluencers, or my work at BuzzFeed, or This American Life, or Netflix. But I'm in your eardrums right now to tell you that I'm hosting The Waves from Slate Podcasts for the next few weeks. Every episode, I'll be joined by a new guest to unpack the latest terrors in gender, feminism, and the pursuit of an even marginally better world. Tune into The Waves wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be there all August. In the years after Operation Chokepoint, crypto offered sex workers a way around the traditional finance sector. Data from Sex Work CEO, a site that provides resources to sex workers, suggests that as many as a third of all sex workers in the U.S. now accept crypto payments. And for sex workers, there's a lot to like about crypto. In particular, it handles that the first leg of the journey really well, right? Like the payment of a sum of money by a client to a sex worker. It's, it's great for the client because, you know, they don't have to supply personal information that they, uh, you know, and they don't end up with an, an incriminating transaction reference on their bank statement that reads, you know, seven ninety nine to OnlyFans and, you know, perhaps their, their spouse or whatever comes across it. it. It's great for sex workers because they can receive payment directly to a cryptocurrency wallet without incurring the fees levied by the platforms, which is another, I suppose, issue with uh, the OnlyFans model is that uh, the fees are significant. Uh, in the region of around 15 to 20%, I believe, but also wow. without interacting with the banking system that refuses to serve them, right? It was, if you don't have a bank account, this is a way for a, for a client to continue to pay you. And it also gets around the infamous chargeback issue with sex work, right? Where um, if you if customers put this, they charge whatever they're paying for on their credit card, and then maybe their spouse like you said, sees, sees the charge and they're like, oh, that was a mistake. And then they ask for their money back through the credit card company. And then the credit card company makes the sex worker pay that money back. Right. Absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. So because crypto transactions by nature cannot be reversed in the same way as, you know, credit card payment, it also liberates sex workers from that risk of, of chargebacks. As you say, this process whereby a payment is, is taken back after a client raises a dispute with their card provider. And, and often at the, the point the dispute was, is raised, you know, they've already received the, the content provided by uh, the sex worker. But for all of crypto's promise as an alternative to the traditional finance system, it never really panned out. Few places, if any, accept crypto as a form of payment meaning that often sex workers need to convert their crypto into cash. And that's where issues tend to come up. The trouble kind of begins when it comes time to move from crypto into you know, a currency that you can use to pay for, for rent, for groceries, for, for whatever else. So one way of doing that would be to go buy a crypto exchange. You're paid directly in cryptocurrency by your client. You take that mm -hmm. cryptocurrency to an exchange, you know, perhaps Coindesk, uh, Coinbase rather, or, or Kraken or OKX or whichever other crypto exchange. And then you convert your crypto into dollars and then you cash out. The problem there is that you know, there are scenarios in which exchanges are closing the accounts of sex workers. So uh, Ali Knox, another sex worker who I cite in, in the story, um, has been banned from multiple crypto exchanges just as she has, has had her bank accounts withdrawn. And, you know, there are also cases when it, it's actually impossible to cash out by exchange precisely because their bank account has been has been closed. And in, in both of those scenarios, you, you have a situation in which someone is stranded in a form of currency that, that can't be used to pay things. Meanwhile, the banks are increasingly unwilling to work with crypto businesses in the wake of the fall of FTX last November. And that means that, you know, the crypto businesses that popped up to make this whole process easier for sex workers, the, they handle the entire flow from, you know, payment by the, the client in cryptocurrency to the conversion into dollars to cashing out to the bank. 
those crypto businesses aren't able to operate because they can't maintain you know the banking relationships of their own right oh <laughs> right right so i mean in the piece the way i kind of put it was that this effort to establish this alternative financial system that can be used by marginalized groups as a means of bypassing traditional banking is is kind of dependent on this uneasy and actually quite rapidly deteriorating truce with the legacy financial institutions that that you're trying to bypass in the first place but in in the case of crypto their regulatory future was sort of pretty m- murky um and and still kind of is pretty murky but with these sex workers, there's illegal and legal work. It almost seems like, shouldn't the government do something? If the work is legal, these people should have access to to the financial system, to banks. I mean, I, I agree. I agree. And so this is the argument of, of the advocacy groups. Frequently, the line among advocacy groups is that all sex work should be uh, decriminalized by criminalizing a, a portion of sex work, i.e. full service sex work mm-hmm. and, and not criminalizing the other uh, the argument goes that you, you create opportunity for a broad brush approach right, right? You, you lump all sex work into, into one bucket and it doesn't matter if if part of it is legal um and part of it not because the whole industry will be treated as if it's uh, illegal so um decriminalization is is one solution one checkpoint on this on this uh, road to solving the banks banking access issue is decriminalization right minimizing the stigma around sex work All of this reinforces a fundamental issue at the heart of the crypto industry. No matter how much it's touted as a decentralized alternative currency, it is tethered to and dependent on the traditional financial system. This idea that crypto can stand alone, kind of in isolation of the banking system as this parallel financial infrastructure is is really a, a misrepresentation because... For as long as crypto can't be used widely to pay for goods and services, as as you said, you know, those that deal in it have to at, at one junction or another, you know, whether that's cashing out via an exchange or, or going via a crypto business that that has to maintain its own banking relationship, they have to interface with traditional finance at some point. And, and that's kind of where the potential to come unstuck lies. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that you have the 30% of the adult industry that are, that are dealing in crypto all of them are, are stuck holding currency they can't use. That that would be um, it, itself a misrepresentation. It, it, it's more the point that this isn't the kind of panacea, this isn't the solvable solution that, that perhaps um, uh, some may have hoped. How are sex workers kind of grappling with all this as the government cracks down more on crypto and the banks crack down more on exchanges in crypto? How are they dealing with the situation? Are they just still, you know, tr- trying to get by, switching bank accounts? What are they doing? That's it, right? I mean, the people who have repeatedly faced these issues, you know, they've, they've, they've been banned from from 30 plus accounts of various, you know, banks or, or payments apps. They're, they're exhausted with the process of kind of shifting from, from one to the next, having to be constantly aware and alert to the opportunity that they may have access and revoke, that they're, they're exhausted, really. Uh, the sense that I get is that they feel like they have maybe a few places to turn. I think one strategy would be to to double down on, on lobbying efforts um, to attempt to kind of increase the profile of of um, the issue that that's faced by members of the the adult industry. The other way in which people are kind of working around the issue is is by attempting to dis- disguise as best they can their activity. You know, whether that's building a front of sorts, you know, opening a business bank account under. A different pretense, you know, behaving in as mm-hmm. uh, in as as best a way as they possibly can, as you know, a regular business might, you know, uh, payments as as regular and and stable and consistent as possible. So Mike Stabile, um, who's a representative of the uh, Free Speech Coalition, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, he, he put it well when he said that the adult industry will continue to exist like a weed. Um, he told me he said that the cracks and, and hostile conditions that other businesses would never survive in the adult industry manages to thrive in because it has to, right? It's not necessarily a kind of positive note to end on uh, because, you know, the the struggles that they've uh, been facing remain. But the sense is that sex workers will find a way somehow to dance around the issues that, that they've encountered. Joel, thank you. No problem. Thank you for having me. Liara Rue is a sex worker, organizer, and writer. 
Joel Khalili is a reporter at Wired covering crypto, Web3, and fintech. You can find a link to his piece in our show notes. And that's it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Mia Armstrong-Lopez. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. If you're a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Get all your lovely Slate podcasts with no ads. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. We'll be back Sunday with another episode. I'm Emily Peck, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary. And you can catch me over at Slate Money. New episodes drop every Saturday. Thanks for listening. Want to feel better, get more exercise, or quit tobacco? Prescription for Wellness can improve your health with personalized sessions based on your schedule. Our expert health coaches and care managers use proven techniques. It's free for UPMC Health Plan members and could lead to the results you want. For more information, visit upmchp.us slash pfwellness. That's upmchp.us slash pfwellness. Hi, you guys. Are you thinking about the same things I am? Like, are you trying to figure out the right way to make fun of Casey DeSantis? Are you similarly concerned about the scourge of bad men from Toronto? Tory Lanez, Tristan Thompson, and Drake, of course, Drake. Are you also worried about the erosion of abortion rights, the restrictions put on gender-affirming care, and what it means if Kyle Richards is actually a lesbian? Great, me too. Now we can do this together. I'm Sachi Cole. You might know me from the podcast Scamfluencers, or my work at BuzzFeed, or This American Life, or Netflix. But I'm in your eardrums right now to tell you that I'm hosting The Waves from Slate Podcasts for the next few weeks. Every episode, I'll be joined by a new guest to unpack the latest terrors in gender, feminism, and the pursuit of an even marginally better world. Tune into The Waves wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be there all August.